Welcome to B-Side Second Day. I know it's like pretty late in the day now, but yeah, good to see all of you. So, I am not supposed to be on that slide yet. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to be talking about how to navigate corporate security as an engineer. And, you know, I, I, I think at first it will seem like I'm talking about soft skills, non-technical skills, but we'll get there. So stay tuned. First off, obligatory disclaimer. I am, uh, my, my views and content in this presentation, I'm just going to read it from here, are mine alone and does not represent the opinions or content of my employer SiriusXM or my former employer Crunchyroll. So, without further ado, here is the agenda. First off, we're going to be talking about corporate security. What is it all about? And then we're going to be talking about stakeholders and then keeping track of all the things and understanding the business, what happens when personnel changes, and then we'll wrap it up. So yeah, hi everyone. I'm Maria. I use they, them pronouns. I used to work at Crunchyroll and uh, I, as a software engineer, and then I was a senior secure application engineer until I became staff security and compliance engineer on the security team. And now at SiriusXM, I am a staff application security engineer working on the application security team. So let's talk about corporate security today. So when it comes to corporate security, do you look at the business as a whole? Are your team's objectives aligned with the business? Then consider your scope of securing all of the things. Do you secure the crown jewels of the company? Do you secure the employees? Do you secure corporate assets? So basically your job is to help the business continue to function through cybersecurity related risk management. So when it comes to corporate security, you will be working with a lot of people, like a lot of people. This is not a job for hermits. So the first thing you got to do is figure out who your stakeholders are. So story, um, when I started out at SiriusXM, um, one of the first things that I did was identify my stakeholders. So you know, it, it could be everyone, it could be a prioritized few, especially when you're drinking from the fire hose. So in any case, start figuring out who the people are that you will be working with. So let's say, do you, do you work with a particular team? Does your team have goals and priorities? Then make sure to prioritize your stakeholders accordingly. Next, make a nice, powerful impression on the people that you work with. Make your words count. So first off, branding. This is about knowing yourself, knowing what you want people to see you as, and defining your narrative. And, you know, branding isn't just a marketing thing. It really is about getting people to know you in a way that you want them to know you as. So if you want to come off as dependable, then act like it, you know? If you want to come off as someone who's good at a particular part of security, then you need to show them how good you are at it, or at least, you know, allude to it, and then they'll see your work. So putting out that strong impression on people can definitely help you in Winning allies and friends and with your stakeholders. Next, messaging. So just like in Nico Montoya, and I know I'm, t I'm probably taking this from another talk, be clear when communicating with others. So when you introduce yourself to these stakeholders, you also want to provide context with anything that you're talking to them about. So here's an example. Um, I, I started out, you know, like just talking to people, introducing myself, but I, I told them that, hey, I work in the application security team 
and I'm going to be working on so-and-so project. Can you help me with this? Can you help me understand? And that's where the specify request part comes in. And then next, with the stakeholders you've identified so far and spoken to so far, does it make sense to dig deeper and work with those that they work with? So think about it this way. You have an org chart, you figure out who your initial stakeholders are, and then you talk to your stakeholders, and then sometimes they will redirect you to other people, sometimes they will introduce you to other people that they're working with, and that's okay, that's exactly what we want. And then lastly, make friends join, you know, like the different social um, gatherings that you have at work. It's really good to get to know everyone that you're working with, or if you don't even work directly with each other, it's still nice to make friends. So you have all of those stakeholders. Now what? Well, there's this thing um, that I, I took a lesson from uh, with regards to like sales folks and all of that. There's this thing called customer relationship management, which is a great tool. It's a great way to keep track of all your relationships with different teams and stakeholders and whatnot. So in a similar fashion, your stakeholders can basically be your customers or maybe even just folks that you work with on a regular basis. Once I figured out who I should start talking to and I've spoken to them a little bit, next up was to keep track of all these relationships and work streams. So the great part about CRMs is that it's an address book and communication notification tool rolled into one. So a little bit of a disclaimer, I did not fully come up with this idea. I actually just played around with Notion a little bit and I found out that they had this thing called like a friend CRM or like a personal CRM tool. And what it had was that you can like keep track of your contacts. You can keep track of the latest updates, the last time you spoke to them. And then they basically had a formula on a spreadsheet that, you know, if you haven't spoken to them in like one and a half months or three months or what have you, you can basically get a notification or you can see on the column here on the, on the left side, it tells you if you need to talk to them again or what. But basically this is a way to keep track of all of the things that you need to work with other stakeholders on, keep track of your work streams and make sure you don't drop the ball I know it's pretty easy to drop the ball when you're working on so many things in a security team. So it's really important for you to organize yourself accordingly. So also keep, consider keeping track of your work streams in a better fashion. Chances are your team will be using some sort of issue tracking tool. So whether or not, you know, the particular issue tracking tool works for you, make sure to keep track of all of the things that you're working with and always document your work as part of making a business case for more resources, for example. So issue tracking is really important when you want to gain more resources or, you know, like get headcount, get more budget, that sort of thing. And then after figuring out how to track work, you then figure out what you're up against. This is why the above lists are so important. So for example, let's take a look at the data inventory. We basically have to figure out where all of the personally identifiable information is, whether or not it's customer data, you know, it depends on the, the kind of security team that you have, but you could possibly have um, PII for your customers or for your employees. So having that data inventory can be pretty important in terms of making sure that you stay um, compliant to regulatory things, I guess. And then 
asset inventory, for example, I think this one's a given. So knowing where and what your corporate assets are, instead of trying to figure it out, like just as an incident goes, is so useful. So, you know, for example, having a risk assessment for these assets to see how much we spend on protecting these, it's really important stuff. And then another example, and this is not an exhaustive list at all, is the software inventory. So knowing what software you own, what software you might be owning in terms of shadow IT, you know, there might be a lot of different employees out there that use something that hasn't been properly acquired. So you want to keep track of all of that stuff as best as you can. So once you know what you have, the next step is to understand the business. When it comes to understanding the business, you will want to do your research. Work again with your stakeholders. You see a theme here? So identifying duplicate work, for example, you want to make sure that when you're working with your stakeholders, you're basically optimizing the way that you work with each other and making sure you don't do duplicate work. You set your priorities accordingly and make sure that you're either working at the same time or working in a scheduled fashion that works for all of you. And then also identify opportunities for collaboration. So for example, at my former job, I actually was um, talking to someone who knew everybody and knew all the work streams. And we were like, this is really useful information. We should work with you more. And she was like, yeah, let's do it. And it was so useful and fun to get to know these different things. So contrast or compare that with a team that is kind of siloed. Imagine the difference between a team that works with other stakeholders and those that basically kind of do their research on their own, not necessarily talking to other teams. It's like night and day. So how do you do your research? Aside from talking to other people, you can document all the things or document those that you prioritize the most. Leave documentation better than you found it. And likewise, write documentation when you can't find it. Sometimes tribal knowledge exists in people's heads, people that have been around for a long time. That could be you, that could be an engineer, that could be hopefully someone who's still in the company. Remember that knowledge leaves with the people involved with it. That's tribal knowledge and someone must write documentation so we can keep a record of what's going on. For example, run books, playbooks, all of the different documentation about where this thing is or that thing or what the office is um, like in terms of networking. So definitely it will require some writing skills, but you can learn about it. So how do you document things? Information architecture is the keyword here. So we should be considering our audience. What are the most relevant pieces of information for them? How do you direct your audience from more general to more specific documentation? And how do you manage navigation of all these different topics? All of those are concepts of information architecture. So look it up on your own time. Definitely something to look into. I will guarantee you that your documentation will look so good once you understand the concept. Now you have your documentation and you have your stakeholders. You understand the business. You're going to communicate with everyone. So communication is so important for teasing out tribal knowledge for documentation. It is important for working well with others and 
do not take it for granted. Definitely not. So you might have seen these different, um, what would you call these? Uh, anecdotes, you know, things that people say. They're like, this meeting could have been an email. You see it in mugs all the time. Or this email could have been a Slack message. Well, the thing is, the, the art of communicating effectively with different people is based on the age old saying that it depends. It really depends on the situation. It depends on the culture of your company. Do people like to set meetings? Then, you know, you might have to go with the flow, go with the preference of your stakeholders. Are employees expected to be diligent with their email? Does everything really get talked about on Slack? It really depends on the situation, basically. And then another thing about messaging is that I do have a few other tips. So for example, right now I'm working with a lot of people on the East Coast. So considering time zones is imperative, especially if you're working with global teams, you might not know it, but you might be working with people from Asia, Europe, for example, and you'll really have to consider a proper cadence for how you're going to be working with them. Asynchronous communication is probably a must at this point, but then meetings, who's going to adjust? So these are just some things to consider. Next, set expectations, goals, and deliverables in meeting descriptions. Or if you don't know the deliverables, you can talk about it and put it in your meeting notes. This is super important, especially when people get a lot of meeting invites and they're double booked, or even if they're not that busy, you don't want people going into your meeting and be like, why am I in this meeting? What is this? Or they might not even come to the meeting because they have no idea what's going on. So it's really important to set those expectations, goals, and deliverables. And then lastly, AppSec CRM. Sorry, that's actually the, the thing that I call the CRM that we use at, um, at my company. So the CRM is basically going to be extremely useful for this, for scheduling follow-ups on a re regular cadence. Now, you can probably, you know, figure this out with your stakeholders, but it's important to keep track using the CRM as well. So that said, you know, you, you can probably figure a lot of this out as you go along, but I think it's important to talk about it as well. So yeah, with regards to all of that stuff, you can make allies of your stakeholders. Just work with them well, communicate effectively, document all of the things, and yeah. So what happens when the personnel changes? What happens during mergers and acquisitions? Team structures change? Or what happens when reorgs happen? What happens when people come and go and you're working with a new set of people? So what do you do now? So the thing is, like I said earlier, knowledge walks out with the people. So it is important to craft repeatable processes and workflows for working with new stakeholders. So here's a little bit of an idea on how you could present it or think about it. So I, I just wrote this last night, to be honest, and I was thinking about how you can probably set a function, an algorithm, a method for how you're working with these different people. Of course, there are going to be certain nuances that you'll want to consider, but at the end of the day, there are processes you can templatize so that you're not reinventing the wheel over and over again when you're working with so many new people. And then at the end of the day, you want to celebrate your wins, take a breather, and remind others like your stakeholders to do the same because it's hard work. They may call this, you know, like soft skills, non-technical skills, but it really is hard work to maintain all of those different connections. So it's really important for us 
to all just take it all in and find time for yourself. So today we discuss what corporate security is, stakeholders and how to captivate them, how to best understand the business, and what to do when the personal changes, like think lather, rinse, repeat, and celebrate your wins with your team. So the slides will be up online soon, but feel free to take a photo of this slide to take home. And yeah, I don't know if we have enough time, but I am open for at least one question. Thank you everyone. And thank you for existing. Thank you, Maria. We have time for one to two questions. Uh, do we have any questions out here? And if not, we can follow up in the lobby. I see one here. Pardon me. Thank you very much, mate. Um, I have a question. What is your uh, kind of approach to networking and uh, kind of building relationships in this field outside of your workplace uh, in the more more broad security community? Okay, so I mostly talked about networking within your company, but you wanted to talk about outside the company, right? Well, for all of those in the room, you're already taking the first step. Be at conferences, volunteer. And, you know, just keep coming and, and then there will be people who you notice are there all the time. So definitely that is one good way to get to know people, join forums, read 2600 magazine, for example, and then, you know, get to know all the different cool things that are going on. Just learning and learn with others along the way. I, I think it, it kind of speaks for itself, the, the power of all of these different conferences, B-sides, for example, it's, it's good stuff. Great, thank you, Maria. And on behalf of B-sides SF 2023 and our gift sponsor, Doyen Sec, we would like to present you with this gift and thank you so much.